So um, I'm going to talk about the internationalizing digital products as a product manager, and I'm going to talk about things that should be tangible enough for you to go and try implement and use say tomorrow. Um, first of all, I'm going to give you some of the credentials <laughs> on where I, where I work that taught me a lot about inter internationalization. Uh, Booking is massive, they have over 40 languages uh, and you know they do, like it's not just a website, they also have apps, they have multiple services, so that's a big one. Then um, I work at Continents as well, so they have like almost like 90 sites uh, and different brands, so Condenas is the publisher of Bo, GQ, Wire, all these magazines, and um, so it was a really, really big challenge as well. And now I'm working at a startup called Reiki for a year now, and we also have to internationalize international, like the product, and we only have six languages, but still uh, same, same challenge. So um, I work at uh, mobile uh, apps but also like web development and they have the differences when it comes down to internationalizing that. Very hard work though. <laughs> like, uh, okay, so these are the three things that we're going to talk today where I'm going to give you kind of like the basics in terms of how to think about uh, internationalizing the products and also uh, what is a good setup. I'm not going to go super super into the details because then you're going to be super bored because you really have to be in the position to be like, oh yes, what is the setup? So I'm just going to give you, you know, like information that at some point in your life, when someone tells you, hey, we got, you, I don't know, we need to go to China, you're like, okay, what is the nice setup for this? Um, and then some tips to work uh, in terms of like copy and how to even get out of a horrible situation. So sometimes, as a product manager, you don't control the when you join a, a team or a product. Sometimes you don't control uh, how it looks or how things have been worked before. So I'm going to give you some tips to work with a, a team and also like the, with the process. So the first thing is the basics. Um, so <laughs> some people think that when you inter internationalize products is that you're just translating. And actually it's not the same. So translate is just, you know, okay, you can get a word and maybe you just change it to another language and sometimes you may need to interpret the word. This concept of internationalizing is that you really want to take your app or your service or your product to a, another market or you have a reason to have your product that is in English, say in Spanish. So the moment that you really, really detach your, your, your self level, like your, your mind about like, oh, you know, this is the same, the moment that you really understand that internationalize is not translation, then that's the first thing that you really you need to do to be able to understand what the process needs to look like. So that's the first thing. They are not the same. This is very like tactical and it, it's part of the process, but this is more like the concept. And this means you really want to have that product elsewhere and you need to understand where the product is, the market, the people. And also, I really want to uh, emphasize this. So country, it's not the same as language. Some people would say, oh, we're going to go to Russia, so we just need to have the, the app in Russian. But maybe if you don't necessarily understand that the country might have a lot of languages, you might just translate into the, the main one. But also, say London, you're London, UK, but there are products here that are just for a specific, say, group of people, and they might not be in English. So, if you really think about making your product international, don't think about countries as the same thing as a language. Try to be country agnostic. Uh, if, if, it depends on the context. Now, everything here depends on the context, but if you really think about the country and then the language, then you can say, well, for example, if you're offering a service in America, it's in the United States, you might need to include languages like Spanish or apart from English, you might need to include other languages. So the country is not just the only thing you need to think about for uh, language. They are quite different. And then the other thing is, uh, some people say, okay, we're going to internationalize the app, uh, but also you need to think about how can you localize the app, because you can make it international, so now you have your product in different languages, but actually the, it's not the same if you say, okay, I'm going to have my product in uh, Spanish, right? But if, you, if your product is in Spain, 
the Spanish that you use is different than the Spanish that you need to use in Argentina or Colombia or Mexico and so on. So this is also different. So it's uh, the fact that you want to have one language uh, in, in a region, you also need to think about how that language uh, can infer and, and, and if you need, for example, different translators for Spanish. That's actually what it means as well, like how big is your team uh, and we are going to talk about that later. So the other question before you even think about international, internationalize your product is uh, do, do, do you really need this? Like sometimes, uh, you know, even the pressure of growing and things like that, so, hey, there is an opportunity in Poland, we need to have our app in Polish, and you're like, oh, okay, let me start, you know, the, the, let me kick off the pipeline and start translating, but like, do you really need to have your app and your service in another language? Are you in the stage of you know, actually doing this? Um, we're going to see uh, towards the end how to kind of answer those questions. So that's that. And then finally, there are some people that think, I mean, this is perfectly normal because even myself, I didn't know how this happened, but there, you know, there are some people that they don't even know how a app goes from English to, uh, say, Spanish, or what happens under the hood. So what I'm going to show you right now, it's uh, a way of translating an app. So where you're going to see it's just two screens, of the, you're going to see the same screen, but one and then what is behind it or under the hood. So here's the, the new welcome screen of the app that we are, we are really close to launch. So, um, so this is actually how it looks to the users. So that's kind of like the English copy for the English uh, or the app in English. And this is how, um, this is what I call keys or everyone calls keys. So I'm going to talk about it. But this is what makes the magic uh, very possible because this means that you know, if you are, if your language is English, once you open the app, this will be like, oh, okay, Elena is using English, give me the copy in English. So, but this is kind of the foundation, the fact that we don't have, uh, that there is something behind it that just tells the app to show the, the right copy. Um, and this is kind of, yeah, remember this, this thing that we're gonna talk about. So they, they're called keys. So, Let's talk about the setup, but I don't know if you have some questions. Keys. Keys. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about it. So, yeah, yeah. so uh, what is the, the setup? So how do you actually translate and localize and you know internalize your app? Yeah. Um. In, I mean, it was a while ago, but the uh, Apple App Store also offers localization as well. Is that kind of would that be that's kind of variation of the apps in. In, in different regions, isn't it? So you have to submit a different um, yeah. uh, PDK or... Like, yeah, APK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. APK. Well, no, well, the APK would be the same, but the, tra the um, descriptions the, and stuff, yeah. you, you vary depending on the... So you, you're basically, as opposed to what you're saying is, this app which you're doing right now, that is dynamic, so it will source where your kind of credentials is uh, approached it from and then it's yes. to its native language. Whereas if you're submitting something for iOS or uh, thinking you're doing localization and have to submit slightly different apps for those regions. Uh, no, no. Actually, you you submit the same app. Yeah. But so, but the app understands the app is connected to a service. Yeah. And then they will download the the copy that they need. Yeah. That's the way. But on the store, what you do is you put all the yeah. descriptions, and yeah. the app store or Play Store they will do it for you. For you. So yeah. they will be like, oh, this user is in this country. Yeah. And this is the description that say like Elena wrote for this country or for this for this language actually. So yeah. they can show it or region depending on how it's set up. And uh, but but the app itself is different than the a store. Yeah. So it's kind of like you could have you can perfectly have an app that understands all that has yeah. all the languages in the world, yeah. but the store is only in English. Because yeah, it's because you have to submit it for those uh, regions within that and then where, and then this example is where it's dynamic and it's just also it's like, but uh, yeah, I mean, you you but you only submit one. Yeah. If if well, it depends. It depends yeah. like how you have your uh, setup on your on the app store. But I always submit one, so I don't need to manage like ten because yeah, it's yeah. like very crazy. Especially if you are the only one, for example. But I'm not the only one. But anyway. <laughs> um. Okay. So we talked about keys and keys. Uh, it, it, this comes from key value pair. So you have a key, you have a value, and they are kind of together. So again. 
these are the keys. And um, and then what? Why? So why do you even need keys? It's just a uh, it's, it's a way of saying okay, the app has some uh, buttons, copy, text, and stuff. But you need that copy to change and to be dynamic and. If you were to have just the copy and then you need to hard code more copy, it's going to be very, very messy and probably at some point your system will not scale. You need to have a huge file of absolutely all the copy and believe me, it's very painful. So a key is a way that you can, it's just, yeah, uh, I don't know how to say it, but it's, it's a key. I don't know how to think about it. But that, that key will have a, a pair, so it will have a value that pairs to it. And then you... Oh, yeah. It's like an API or... Can you, is it software? Like, do you have a, a name of a field member? Uh, I will. I will give you some some recommendations over the day. I use a lot. So there is a section called like to build or to buy. So you okay. Can, all right. I'll wait. Uh, so, but basically, uh, those keys, which are the kind of like variables, and then there are some something that is inside, or you can call it anyway. So these keys, they need to have a naming convention. So when you are working with different teams, uh, I mean, this is best practice uh, based, based on experience, so very painful experience. So if you have a naming convention, then it's very easy for the team that you're working with to create their own set of keys. So imagine that you are designing, uh, you, you are designing the screen, and then you're like, okay, we need to translate these. So you know that there is a naming convention to create what goes under the hood and then you're like well we always start with i don't know the the section so everything would be onboarded <coughs> and we always put the second level is i don't know uh, it's going to be the action i don't know so okay here you go and then it's kind of like where it is and then so you can create your naming convention so that everyone in theory, there, you should have one owner of the process, but imagine that you don't have an owner, so at least you have an organized system and it's easier to find, oh, you know, there, say, there was a, a problem with this sentence, and you know, okay, this is on the onboarding uh, section, so you can go and try to try find it out, and then that's kind of how, why you need a naming, naming convention, because then it's easier for you to manage the whole process and to then submit this to translators and so on. So, um, again, these are things that even myself, at the very beginning of my career, I was like, uh -huh. but then when it comes on to actually translate and then feeling the pain, it's like, oh, well, yeah, it's better to have a naming convention because then it's easier even to create all the keys. So, talking about key creation, uh, imagine that you have to redo your whole app. So you have an app that has, I don't know, say, even like 10 flows, <coughs> and you're like, okay, we need to start creating all these keys, and that's a, if you don't have a system, it can take you like up to one or two, three weeks, I don't know, to think about, okay, how am I gonna name this copy here, say the button, buy now, like, oh, I need to find a key for this. So the way I do it, and the way I do this, and the way I do uh, tracking as well, because tracking events need to have names, I just go and, I mean, this is my method, <laughs> I don't know if it's the best, but I just go open a spreadsheet and I'm like, okay, how many levels I'm gonna need for this uh, for this key? Usually I keep it up to three because it's the way I think, like three things. Um, so for example, what I tend to do is like, okay, this is gonna be the key, and this is gonna be the copy. So that if I'm in the English, uh, I'm using that in English instead of looking at this, I'm gonna look at this copy. So to create this key very very quickly. I just open Excel uh, or a spreadsheet and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have three levels. One, two, three. This is gonna be the section, this is gonna be, say, the area, the section, and the action. And then I, here there is this formula, uh, which is concatenate uh, cells. So it's like join, and gonna join this, 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 and this is my result. So basically, after I go, ta -ta -ta -ta, and I, I go through a flow, I will have a set of keys, and then I can upload it to whatever system I have. I mean, this is like, it's not perfect because ideally you should have a, a content designer or someone that is working with the engineers and the designers at the same time. But imagine that you really have to redo your whole app and you need to create all the keys yourself. This will be very useful, I guarantee you this. <laughs> so, and also the placeholder is uh, in the language that you, uh, your, your base language or the default. Okay, so uh, say that now you have you have the keys, so now your whole app 
if you were to inspect your app, your app, you have all the flows, but instead of copy, you see everything has like area, I don't know, like an onboarding dot uh, section, whatever, onboarding intro dot CTA. So everything has keys and everything has a placeholder. Then, uh, of course, you need to have a system for this. You need to somehow connect, like, there are different uh, services for this. But then the keys is just the setup for your app, and you need to have the service that will put things together, and then I'll talk about later. But the other part of the puzzle that is very, very important is, okay, who is going to translate this? And how I'm going to help the translators to understand what the flow is all about. So this is another part that is super important for a good setup, is that you have a way to provide context to the translators. Because if you only send you know, a screenshot, and you're like, hey mate, can you translate this one? They, they can translate, of course, but they may be very, very literal. And I had, had cases, uh, especially one time in Canada, we were translating some buttons and stuff. And I remember in France, I think, I think uh, for, for both parties, I remember, it's like one of the, um, the call to actions, instead of being the right word, it was so literal, it's something like grass or something like that. And it's like, why this button is grass? Like, what, what, why grass? Ah, because no one gave context, so it probably was another word similar to grass, I guess. Um, so, context is like keen for translators. Uh, and also, if, especially if they are not in house, especially if you're hiring people outside your your office or even your country. So um, when I say ways to provide context, it's okay, for example, do you how do you share the screenshots? Do you only share one screen and you write down the description? Do you actually share the whole flow? Do you actually share the website uh, in a development mode so they can just you know go through it and understand how it works? Is it that you have a regular call with them? You know, is it that you use a tool that already has something built for them to see the context? So, if you want to remember something from this, it's just the word context. You need to provide context so that your translations uh, are really you know, high quality. Then, um, where do you see the changes? Like, what happens if you, uh, you know, instead of saying, oh, you know, we don't want to say, let's go back, say that we don't want to say join my team, I want to change it to be like uh, log in with your account. Okay, so imagine that I go and I, on my system, I change from join my team, I change and uh, log in with your account. How do I see the change? Well, there are two differences, main differences. Um, so, web browsers versus apps. The, let's say the speed of change is a bit, or the speed of to where you can see the change is very different. So for web browsers, if you have a quick deployment process, you can, it's almost like, almost like instant. You can go, change it, deploy it, see the change. For apps, you can have, there are multiple ways of doing this, um, but you need to really have a setup that allows you to uh, refresh, say, refresh the app and get the latest content. Um, it's not as maybe easy as web browsers, uh, but both, you will you will see the change. But for apps, you really need to think about it. Like, okay, we're we are gonna use this software that allows to um, say get the keys, get the content. It's part of the deployment process, and you need to make sure that depends on how fast you want to go. You really have to design this process. It's the same for web browser, but it's like less. Uh, I would say less involved in my experience. So for apps, it's like, okay, we're going to actually get the keys, we're going to refresh the app, but we're not going to publish the app, we're just going to refresh it. There's a, um, I can give you more examples later if you're interested. Uh, okay, so what a healthy pipeline feels like. So a healthy pipeline feels like this. You go, you think about what are the problems you want to solve in your product, uh, hopefully you have a bunch of people to work with, like at least one engineer, one designer, so at least someone can talk to you about what you want to solve. But then you, if you have a content designer or a copywriter, that would be super amazing because that, that's the person that can think about how to, even like microcopy, how to uh, you know, convey the, the idea that this is this feature and does this and this and that, or just what is the best call to action here and stuff like that. So imagine you, you talk to these people and so you have an idea, do whatever process you want to do, I don't know, agile, waterfall, whatever like method you want to choose. 
But then a healthy pipeline looks like you start developing, and at the same time, you have the content designer, yourself, QA, whoever is doing the job of like creating the keys. At the almost the very same time, they go and do the process of key creation, gives the keys to the developers so they can put it on the code, just that. And then they go and talk to the translators at the same time, be like, hey, we're going to develop this feature and hear the, hear the flows and stuff, provide the context. And that allows the following, that when your feature is ready, your, your you know, content is ready, but also your translations are ready and you can go and launch. The worst thing that can happen is that you are completely blocked by translators or translations in a, in a, in a sense. Um, at Booking, for example, I remember, this is like two years, three years ago. Um, uh, for example, we were, uh, I was the product owner for all the user accounts, so like millions of users and stuff. And then at some point we were like changing the way people were uh, able to log in and so on. And we <laughs> wanted to release the experiment, but we were like, okay, we only have English, but we need, you know, uh, it's like, I don't know, Spanish, Spanish from Spain, Spanish from, Spanish from uh, Argentina, uh, I don't know, like Russian and all that. So we were like, okay, we cannot necessarily release at the same time. We might need to start releasing this feature only for these uh, users and then like roll out release, which is not a bad thing to do, but it's, it's not the same as, okay, let's start, you know, release if you, if that's the plan, release uh, the, everyone. So if you start your development at the same time, or say, if the translation, translations start at the same time as your development, then your chances of success in terms of like releasing to everyone, they are really, really high. So that's how a healthy pipeline looks like or feels like. Um, just for, for the records, <laughs> I've been in both. So now, in terms of uh, deployment process and automation, uh, I can go very deep into this, but it's it's very it's not I don't want to say the word technical. It's not technical. It can be very like heavy and boring. <laughs> but the deployment process and automation, what I want to emphasize here is you don't want your um, process, so you don't want your translations and copy changes to be blocked by developers and you don't want developers to be like oh wait, I need to stop developing and be like oh let me just change a word if your developers need to always stop their development and go and change copy that is a sign that there's something very messy and wrong in the process because it means that you have either a lot of like minor work or the deployment process of the app is very tight like everything's super super tight to so say one person is the only one that can push the button and if that works for you, that works for you. But for me, I like to make it more independent. And just because it's uh, just a bit better and also people are kind of more autonomous. And however, you need to have ways of rolling back, monitoring, how, you know, assuring that the quality is correct and stuff. Um, but yeah, for the, pro the pro problem process, ideally, you can deploy the app, but you also have a way of deploying new content and new copy. And they can be together. You know, you can ship the app or a new feature with new copy. But say that you have the existing app and there is a copy change, you should have a way of making the change and then the app just fetch the new data and then shows the, the change in the copy. Uh, so that you don't need to redeploy the app. This is ideally. Uh, web, web development allows this like, easily. But, um, but yeah, this is just in, in general. And then the question, uh, you know, do you crowdsource your translations? Do you do machine translations? Do you use humans only? Uh, how do you actually get the translations? It depends on where you are uh, in terms of the products, uh, the company, how much money you have, uh, how passionate is the people that use your product, uh, you know, like how good the tools you have uh, are, like how good they are actually. Uh, for example, crowdsourcing, Twitter, when they were kind of uh, growing, they were like, how do we actually, you know, like, it's not that how do we actually translate Twitter, it's more like, how can we make it scalable? So they had a really strong community of people that loved the product, and they were like, hey, do you want to translate Twitter, your language? And they were like, oh, yeah, I want it. So they signed up, and then you had a bunch of uh, translators, but because they had also tools for, you know, cross-checking translations and stuff, the quality was a bit better. And um, if you do crowdsourcing, you really have to have a way of, you know, verifying that the translation is, is correct and it's not just like a bad word and someone was like, ah, this is funny, let me just put this thing. So, 
that's that's one. I mean, Google, they are like the masters of these things. Uh, I also know about uh, Badoo, for example, uh, here in London. I remember seeing this that they also use uh, the community to translate some parts of the, parts of the app. Um, but this requires uh, that you have a way of cross checking the translations. Then say you have machine translation, so what is a machine translation? So this is usually services that other platforms will offer, so it's kind of like, you know, if you put the, um, the content in, in English, we can give you the content in Spanish, Russian, I don't know, like Mandarin, blah, blah, blah. it is going to be like a machine learning generated or AI, 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 my head for that, <laughs> have so many so, um, so yeah, it's more like it, it could be uh, even like services like Google. So they can, you can say, okay, I'm gonna actually use the API to just have like a baseline. And this is useful for this, for to create kind of like a baseline. If you are the only person, I mean, that's very sad that you are the only person translating, and you should not maybe translate in a language that you don't understand. But say that you want to have a baseline, you might use machine translations, and then you can hire a person that can just uh, you know check if things are correct um, and then say that you, you don't want to crowdsource you don't want machine translations you want humans and um, then how do you do this well you can hire uh, agencies so freelancers uh, or agencies that actually specialize specialize on these things or you can use a uh, talent in-house so you can use people that work with you However, it would be very, very useful if you have, for example, you have a professional translator to do the first pass on the app or the service, and then you can go and use either people in house or users just to check that the translation makes sense uh, and that the, the app, you know, the, the call to action and stuff actually makes sense in the flow. So for humans, it's more like, do you really have the money? And if you do have the money, I mean, I guess this is the, the most uh, accurate, but for this one, whereas here you really have to have a system to cross-check, here you have to have a system to give context. So if you don't give a lot of context, then you might waste a lot of money here. So um, this is the spectrum of the setup. So you usually start here, like, okay, this is the first time I'm going to do actually this thing. And then you end up in like, oh my god, I'm pro, but this takes, it could take years, uh, actually. Or it could take uh, like big uh, services like Booking, for example, that you really need to understand how it works because your experiments, uh, they need to be translated and they need to be localized and stuff. So you will start here and it's gonna, be, it's gonna feel horrible. Sometimes your team will be like, oh my god, I cannot translate because I don't have the files and I need to find it. And, you know, or your app could be half, half, so English and the other language and stuff. But then, uh, when you, what a pro is more like, okay, you understand how to uh, cross-reference the translations, or you have a way of deploying the translations independently from the app. And so when you're here, it's more around, you understand how the process uh, works and what's ideal for your product, how fast you want to translate, how quickly you need the, the changes to appear on the app or on the website. So that's the spectrum. And then, uh, I'm going to give you some pro teams. So the first one is going to be a quick tell of the setup from hell and how to get out of this. Because, uh, and this is kind of almost like a real story, <laughs> the thing is when you um, say you, you join a company and they're like, hey, you know, here's the app or here's the service or here's the, here's the part, here's part of your product in this massive uh, service or massive app. Sometimes your setup is not the, the best. This, I think, is most, uh, or is common in uh, companies or apps that is maybe the first or the second time that they need to look at internationalize their, their apps. So how a setup from hell looks like. For example, you would have hard-coded copy mixed with keys, so you have some copy that's actually, what appears on the app is like this on the code and then that's it, with some keys, so you have these weird, you know, things with dots and stuff. Um, this is very hard because then you're like, oh my god, the app says, you know, there's a spelling mistake, we need to fix it. Oh, where is the key? No, actually, don't fix, the, like, don't fix it on the, so the, on the software. Fix, we need to fix it on the code. And it's like, oh, okay, well. So, 
this is very painful because it's very hard to know where to change things or the change happens or appears. This is this is so common but it's very very horrible, which is keys as English copy. So when I say keys, it's like the identifier. So imagine, uh, whereas uh, this took it too far in the, the presentation, but um, if I have say uh, onboarding dot intro, you know that. You know, it could be whatever copy. So it could say, "Welcome to Reiki." But if your if your key, which should be a you know agnostic value or whatever, it says, "Welcome to Reiki," but now this needs to say, "Welcome to Reiki, Elena." It's going to be so hard to understand that whatever you know that the key is actually the copy, but it's not the copy because the copy is this. It's, so basically, if when you when you think about keys. Just think about like this structure, uh, kind of like strings or, or, or words, uh, because otherwise in the future it's going to be very painful. For example, say buy now, if your key says buy now and you want to change, change the actual copy to say uh, uh, reserve, reserve this or book, say book, okay, you can change the copy, but when your translators are going to do the work for you, they're gonna look at book and then by now they're gonna be like, what's the actual word in the insert? So use always like this weird uh, naming convention, which it's never English copy, so that would be good. And uh, the other thing would be like if you have these two things and then you have that the files are, you know, the changes and everything is super manual and it's updated by the developers. Um, it's also painful because they might need to drop what they are doing to try fix this and you're like, oh no, it's taking too long. Or for example, there, there might be, say that you, you know, there's a legal requirement to change something because GDPR, for example, and your company could get sued or something like that. Or, and you're like, okay, we have to change this. And the better person is like, okay, wait, but I need to finish this. And okay, okay, fine, fine. And then someone needs to actually manually do the work. It's, it's very, very painful. So these three things, it's kind of like, ah, and then it comes down to, you know, you need the developers to also change the copies, not just that they need to update the files, they also need to change it, because then they need to do the whole work. And then there is no way of providing context to the translator. So you only have a person there, you maybe send uh, a screenshot and that's it, and then you get some copy and it's not uh, like proper to the, to the flow. So this is how something very painful looks like. And maybe at the beginning you're like, oh, I, don't know, I can do it with this, but then uh, if you try working this way for, I don't know, three, four, five months, at some point it's going to burn you out. You're going to be like, no, please. So how do you get out of this? There are different ways of getting out of this. This is a good thing. So you have to have independent pipelines. You also have to have a, you know, sorry, sorry for that. And you have to have independent pipelines, but also you have to uh, kind of like, Restructure bit by bit your your app. I'm gonna go into the, the theme in the next know, like five minutes. So apart from the independent pipelines, which is very very important, it's one of the most important things in this talk is the ability to you know you have the app and you have app development here, you have translations here, and they are independent and they can they can go together. If you have a process that optimizes for for this, then you you are gonna be able to work in a better way. I'm not going to say like less stress because it's always stressful, but in a better way. So here's the software bar, like, okay, do you buy the software, do you build the software? Um, the, okay, so in terms of buying software or paying for software, there are different companies. So there's uh, PhraseUp is one, it's like a startup, I think, in Germany. And there's Cordova, uh, that's also one, I don't know where they are, but yeah, that's US. One. US, okay, excellent. Um, they have like pros and cons. The good thing about a software is that you don't, you, there is already documentation, uh, other people also use it. If, for example, there are small businesses, like say, for example, they might accommodate, accommodate some of the feedback and stuff. And the benefit I see is that you don't need to think a lot about how do you, you just need to think about the setup and how to, to do your own process within the company. But you don't need to go and think about, okay, how do we do we build our own API to our own service and do we store the keys ourselves and that? Then you can just be like, okay, well, we're gonna create the keys, we're gonna upload it to 
to the service and we are just put all the translators on Phrase and they're gonna just translate. And the app is gonna be connected to Phrase So everything goes to Phrase Up and we get it from Phrase Up, for example. I mean, I'm not endorsing Phrase Up, they're not paying for this, so yeah. Um, but basically, what this gives you is just a centralized place. Probably they, they work developing the tools, so less bugs, less problems. Um, now, if you are booking.com, for example, it would be super expensive to uh, try use, say, phrase up because you will have a lot of users, as in like you would have all the development team, product managers, copywriters, translators, so a lot of people trying to use the service. Um, and at the same time, you have, apart from the translators, like in-house or something, you will have like agencies and stuff. Uh, so when you really, really need to translate and when you're Revenue really, really depends on all these regions and all these like countries and stuff, and languages as well. It might be a good idea to uh, invest in building. Also, it depends on the scale of the service, but building gives you kind of yeah, what the, the same thing. It gives you uh, it's, it tailor, tailors your uh, or the product to your needs. So, for example, Booking had um, a way of their system is called Lingo. So it's, it's really, really, really fit for booking. So it's connected to experiments. So the, the, the translators can just translate. You can see how the pipeline is, is progressing and how many languages you have available for your experiment. You don't need to do a lot of setup because everything's connected to the experiment tool and stuff like that. And for the developers, they just need to put one thing and that's it. So they just need to kind of hook it up and that's it. So it's really, really built for booking. Whereas this is more generic, so anyone can actually use it. Um, but yeah, but if you really need to, uh, if you're going to pay a lot of attention to, to inter internationalization and your revenue is going to come directly from different markets and you're going to need to localize and, I don't know, Spanish, but absolutely all the differences in Spanish and stuff like that, for example, you might want to build it. Or if you have particular needs, you might want to build it, uh, so that you can consider. And then uh, there's another thing here. So I heard people like, okay, I'm gonna use WordPress to uh, just translate my app and stuff like that. I've heard that. And there is a difference between, say, microcopy and the copy that you see on the app versus long form, long form content. So say that you're using Phrase App to change the words on, on your app, and you're like, oh wait, but I can actually say I, I wanna write about. You know, I want to have a blog in different languages. I'm going to do it on PhraseUp. Maybe PhraseUp is not the best place because it will not have like a lot of capabilities. Like I don't know. It's, I mean, you might need to hack it a lot to have like uh, titles and to have the the format of your content in, in the right way. So if you want to have your app in say Spanish, so you want to have all the copy and the log and the, the CTAs and stuff like that. CTAs is culture. So you want to have all these things, uh, you can use, this is microcopy for example, and you can use Phrase App or whatever tool, not Phrase App, whatever tool for this. Uh, whereas if you want to blog about, I don't know, the community that uses your app, uh, you want to blog or you want to write about even like terms and conditions and things like this, you might want to use a content management system here rather than the same tool that you use for, for the app because it might get a bit messy. I mean, maybe not, but uh, just giving you an idea that for app development, web development, and buttons, and small copy, and things like this, maybe a tool, and here, maybe a content management system. So that would be the way I see it. Um, finally, uh, if you have uh, the chance, or if you can, it would be amazing if you hire a great content designer, because they would be the ones that will own the process, and ownership for translators and, and, and also internationalization is very important. So that would be, I mean, of course, but it's important. So finally, how can you start with all this tomorrow? So, well, first of all, if you have a team, talk to your team and you're like, hey, you know, I went to this talk <laughs> and I think we should uh, think about actually uh, internationalizing the app or we actually need to think about the process to do so. Um, that would be the first thing. Talk to your team about that because they might have ideas or maybe they, they had an experience. You never know. And 
the, the first, so apart from that, uh, you need to identify where your product is. So first of all, can you afford internationalization? Because it's not just a setup, you also need to think about how can you maintain your app in that language? Because it's not, okay, my app is in English. Okay, excellent. But then you develop a new feature, you solve another problem, you're gonna release it. Oh wait, it needs to be in English and in Spanish and you know, all these languages. So, uh, so it's not just the first translation, it's also like how can you keep up and maintain that language if it makes sense. Do you understand why, I mean, where are you gonna get if you have your app in another language. That's very basic, but it's very important. Um, also, do you have already a setup? That's a way of identifying where, where you are. Yeah, you might have already a setup to translate your app, but it might be good or bad. Um, and for example, another important one, do you need to drop a language, or do you, do you need to maybe deprecate or stop translating? Sometimes that's actually what you need to do. Imagine that you have a, a, an app that is uh, translated in 20 languages and that's actually, you know, you're paying a lot for it. Maybe this just makes you realize that actually we just, just need to scale down or just remove those languages. And that also requires some process because you may need to clean your code, you may need to clean the app or remove the app from the store and so on. So the other one is um, you need to identify how the setup looks like, what is the current one. So do you have naming conventions, what is the software, and what is your deployment pipeline, how do you get the copy, uh, you know, who is translating, is it, is it someone in you know, the company, is it outside, and how long it takes to complete a translation, or how fast you can get your feature in, uh, in another language. All these together with your you know, like product cycle and like uh, the, the development cycle that all plays together and it, it actually um, makes an impact to know all these things. Then, this is very important. So, uh, this is a lot about the process because this is actually the, the, the core of it. So, you go and be like, okay, yeah, we have a way of translating the app, but let's uh, identify where the time is going. Like, what's the most manual process that you have? and what is the most painful process. If you really want to, for example, the, the set it from hell, if you want to get out of it, the first thing I would do is just to draw the, or the, yeah, I would just put together all the flow and I would be, okay, what is the most manual process here? Oh, you know, it's probably an increase, getting the files, putting it on, on the, you know, on whatever folder, and then sending this to, I don't know, another person. Okay, we need to try automate this, for example. But also, what is the most painful process? Because maybe Chris does this and he's like, you know, chill, like, yeah, it's really nice. But actually, maybe the most painful process is getting the translations or chasing people around the company, like, hey, we need the Spanish translation. That, that might be painful. So look for those two things when you are uh, thinking about the process what's painful, what's manual, and try to see how can you uh, remove that. Then, you can be like, what is the ideal world? And then it's like, okay, if you have uh, an app uh, or uh, a service on the web, how this process would look like, what would be the ideal one, uh, how, you know, what, how long are your development cycles, is it like, for example, booking every day you need to release an experiment, is it like on the app that has like a memory a bit more like a big uh, or longer cycle? Is it like I work at TFL or 4 as well and they have like a different cadence on how you release? Or is it like a startup and you need to be releasing like every day for example or every week? So you have to consider uh, this, otherwise it would be very organic and suddenly you're like, oh my god I'm stuck in this process, no. So design it, very important. <laughs> and then uh, resources and people, so who do you have to, I mean, ideally, how does, it, how does it look like, but also, do you hire translators, do you just outsource it, uh, or do you, you know, have like machine translations and so on. Um, we're about to finish now, so if you have all these things in your, idea, in your head, so you know the current process, you know how painful it is, you have your ideal process, you can go and talk to the team and you can be like, listen, this is what I thought about, Here's the idea, and then they can be like, depends on your team. I mean, if you have a really proactive team and they are like, oh yeah, we want to own everything, maybe you discuss with them, like, okay, let's think about how can we make this happen. 
or you can be like, hey, here's the plan. It depends on where, what kind of company you are in. And then you can ask for feedback. You can say, hey, is this even feasible? Can I, can I, you know, have instant uh, updates on the app so I can ch see the code? Uh, sorry, the, the copy change. They can be like, yes, but it's going to take a year because we need to, I don't know, refactor the whole code base to achieve that. You can be like, hmm, okay, let me see. But I don't know. You can be like, yes, okay, let's do it. So uh, ask for for feedback and feasibility. That's very important. And finally, start with small task because the hard part at this point, say you talk to the team and everyone's like, yes, you know, we, this, is a, this is great, this is the right um, setup, this is a great, great idea, uh, but then it's like, okay, bye. No, you have, you have to start, but start with something small, so it could be like, hey, let's automate this, this process that is manual, let's start with automating it, or let's, uh, let's buy the, the software, or let's start building depending on what you, what you need. But start with something small, and finally, the questions because that's that's it. So yeah, yeah, that would be that would be the the, the, the wrap up to this. But at the same time, just to complete, is that when you start with um, the translation process, and when you start changing the workflow, you will have people saying like, oh no no, we we need to have uh, say you. Have developers that never experienced this before, they could say, "No, no, no it's better if I control the translations because I don't want I don't want people messing up with my with my code or with the deployment process." So you can go ahead and explain, "Well, but in the future, it's going to be very painful for you because you're going to be in the middle of something, and then you're going to be interrupted by, hey, we, need, we just need to change hello for welcome,' and that's you know like so. But you you will face some challenges there in terms of the risk of Oh, I don't want anyone to manage this process, but also you could face the, the hey, why do we even need a tool for the for the keys? What are the keys? And so on. So, um, if you really have uh, this kind of pushback, you can, uh, for example, talk to me. <laughs> if you have questions, I mean, I can be like, yeah, you can solve the situation like that. Or inform yourself, talk to the people that also work on the tooling, say the people from Cordova, Fresa, whatever tool, because sometimes they have ways of explaining what are you trying to achieve to the technical team or to even like your boss or whoever. Uh, it's trying to say like, hey, no, maybe not. Um, because sometimes for, especially for startups, it's not, you know, from all the things that they can start investing in the money, this is like, you, yeah, we just want to be. We just want to translate the app, it's like, but actually, it's a process. So, so yeah, that would be it. Um, I just wanted to, in general, ask. So, from your point of view, mm -hmm. internationalization is the same as translation. No, no, it's not. It's not. It's not the same. It's not exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, what would you come? What would? You, how would you define internationalization? Then? No. So basically, it's your product that it's understood by someone in another country, as someone, say, in, in the English language, will understand your product. So, like, this is very hard to explain, but I say, I use mm, Booking.com in English, yeah. and I understand the product in English. You are going to try and achieve this in another language. So, it's not that your app is going to be just translated into Spanish, it's that when a Spanish user yeah. is using your product, is understanding the product, the service, terms and service, terms and conditions, is understanding how to go through the funnel. So it's it's that your app and your product is in, for that region, for that market, but also for that user that is in that language. So that's Correct. Right. I understand what you mean. Um, again, I come from a localization background, so uh -huh. for me, internalization is actually something else. What is it? Internalization is that you make the product ready for localization. But they are then two things, right? So exactly. So I, yes. Internalization sits here. Localization sits on top of it. Oh. Translation. So internalization. One of the example is that you use UTF-8 code, mm -hmm. for example. Yes. So that's for me a step that your company needs to do. Yes. You might that future never translate, but your code is in UTF-8, for yeah. example. Yeah, that's yeah, one yeah. example. Yeah. The other thing is your. Um, your your content needs to be easily localizable. Exactly. So, you so have and that is, to be honest with you, that's the reason I came actually to this because I was hoping that 
you would give some um, um, tips about that, how to make your content localizable, because that is what I'm struggling with right now. Okay, and then tell me how, what are you struggling with? I can give you an example, but I don't want to take everybody's time for my, my specific So are you, are you struggling with the technical part, which is like... No, 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 no. You're struggling with... The content. With the, the content, content. Is that, yeah, yeah. So, because as you mentioned a few times, is that we start a product thinking about only that one region or that country. So we write in English, it's perfect and it makes sense. But then once you want to localize, oh, this cannot be translated because you have a variable there that is dependent on the gender of the rest of the sentence. Yes, yes. So how do you do that? So that to me is another local uh, internationalization step to make your product ready for localization. Exactly, yeah, but that's why when you use keys and you have services like depends on your on your software, but yeah. say if you use I don't want to promote phrase up, but I use phrase up in Porto. But say a phrase up you can actually You can use SDL, that's one of the other okay, that's providers. One. Thank you. Uh, you can actually set it up and in on the code as well you can say for example even in terms of prices here we can have the pound, the pound sign and then the number, but in other, in other countries you will have the number and the pound sign, yeah. or you have right to left, so the whole lab needs to change. It's not like, oh, I just yeah. switch the ratio, it's not like that. So that is, is two things, a technical challenge as well, yes, but also someone needs to understand why you need to do this, or why you need to yeah. have your content yeah. right to left. Um, but it's not so. It's, it's it's hard to be super uh, tangible here because it depends on how do you have expertise in house to understand that your you have to have UTF or or, or even like do you have expert expertise in house to to understand that your app would need to use maybe the language of the phone rather than the IP so things like that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, but but. but but it's interesting that you see uh, internationalization and localization. I, I, I do see, so basically you see it like this, I see it like that, but I don't know. Yeah. But they're, yeah, but they're different, yeah. they're different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I agree. Yeah. Do you know, uh, maybe kind of, with especially with apps and stuff, could you not maybe have everything there through a content management system, like a CMS, which then you can um, Fetch. Uh, yeah, edit, and then it will just be live always? Well, the thing is, with the content management system, you have to set it up like that. So you yeah. would, you would need to be like, okay, this button I mean, call to action. Of it, yeah. Yeah, but that also means that you might need to have connection, for example, all the time to be able yeah. to fetch. Do you actually fetch and store things on the app? Like, the thing with the content man management system is that it's designed for kind of I don't want to say long form because you you can actually write just a little. But you need to have a software that is designed for storing these kind of values and, and like the yeah, copy. Yeah, SQL table or something. Not well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but the CMS, a CMS is like very powerful for media, for images, yeah. you know, co content uh, in a way that maybe it's like long form. That's not how I, I see it. Maybe it's like very like yeah. But when I think about the app and all the flows. If I were to use a CMS, it would be a very intense, also intense on the performance of the app because it would be like oh, I need to maybe call this this page just to get the the, the content. I would need to have everything on my say Prismic is one of the CMSs that they provide a lot of API, so you might need to be like fetching all this stuff. So it can become very performance like heavy, heavy yeah. I guess. But but yeah, I mean fair enough. You can you can totally use a CMS. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, um, so it seems like um, from your experience and uh, internationalization seems to cut across mostly languages and how to fit it for operas in the new country. So if you have um, a, a situation whereby it's about either legal framework, um, mm -hmm. different how they do business in that country, is it just Yeah. You? Yeah. So like you give yeah, an yeah. example, so in Arabic it would be for left to right. So what other scenarios have you seen? So yeah, so you, you actually mentioned that legal uh, is not just like oh I have my terms and services. Yeah. In tra translators actually they comply to the law in, in that country or in that region. That's one. Yeah, as you said, uh, other things that are different. 
Well, yeah, even like not necessarily right to left or, or where, where the signs are, it's either even like colors, stuff like that. So, red, you might use it for one country, but another country might be not the same meaning. Um, you even have images uh, that can be offensive. Uh, so, for example, say, Condoleezza is a good example in terms of like how uh, flexible your system needs to be, and you really need to understand your market because maybe. Uh, you know, avant-garde uh, fashion show in New York can be super offensive for, I don't know, like uh, both India that cannot put that content because the advertisers will be like, hmm, you know, that hmm, doesn't fit, you know. So it could be something like that. You know, it could be, I mean, sometimes it's not, but. Uh, so yeah, it's about like, yeah, what is the culture? Um, but yeah, it's mostly about images, media, colors, uh, and yeah, the legal part. These are the ones that I experienced myself. So yeah, but and yeah, and, and prices and, and uh, how you express like exchange rates and stuff like that. Even like sometimes if you know, say booking, um, you would have say, say that say that you're booking at an hotel in China, and you are talking to the the host there. Um, you are okay. We are not gonna internationalize and trans translate for you, but we need to think about the experience because you both have different languages and your product, even if it's in English, this person is interacting with a person in another language, and you have to make it so that they don't send like if someone sends an emoji or something. Like, I don't know. Like you at least present the information in a way that understands the other country or the other like, culture, I would say. But everything could be pinned into languages, so. It's also like philosophical, I guess, sometimes. It's like, hmm, is this even like important in these languages? Things like that. Uh, but yeah, mostly myself, uh, in terms of experiences, images, legal stuff, and like how you move things from one side to another. Yeah. Yep. I think you briefly mentioned about keys being used in analytics. Oh, okay, yes. Uh, well, not necessarily keys. Uh, the, the method I used to create the keys is the same method I used to create uh, tracking events, okay. which is like, I, I, it's for naming conventions, so yeah. I really like to be very fast. So I'm like, okay, what is going to be the first level, second level, third, third level, and then everything is kind of cohesive. Okay. And three level is good enough for you too? Uh, usually for me, yes, because I also don't, uh, you know, when you look at the code, if you have a key or a tracking event that is really long and you're reading the code and whatever, for example, even it, it would be, it takes a lot of your cognitive load to be like reading all the stuff and then, so three for me is the magic number. It also forces me to be kind of uh, consistent, so action uh, or action section and whatever they're doing, and then if I have the same thing, sometimes you could even associate like, oh, this is the onboarding flow with the onboarding keys and the onboarding tracking. So everything's like, onboarding. That's how I like to organize myself, I'm very organized. So, yeah. <laughs> what, do you, what do you do in situations where designs fall apart because some words like CTA is just way too long in certain languages? Yes, yes. So this and is another question, uh -huh. just a curious one. Uh, what was the maximum number key you were dealing with with a given app? Okay, okay, good. Okay, so for the first question, which is how you, for example, how do you fit words in German or Russian that are like, like this, and you're like, oh, hey! So, well, first of all, if you ever think about going to those regions, uh, you have to think about so your design system or whatever you do for design needs to consider always the maximum width. So you, you never design, or at least you, you could start with the English, but then almost like a, a second, like even like a reflex of that, oh, how would it look like in German? So you try to get the same word, and you go and like, go through and be like German, and be like, okay, well, it might fit. So that would be more like how, at the beginning, I started to, to think about it, like, okay, how does this work in Russian or in German? Always like ask my reference. Um, but that's from the point of view of like me, uh, product manager. Now, the the other thing that you can also, or the other thing that we recommend is, on the actual design, you have rules. So okay, if is, if your word is uh, longer than this amount of characters or the white character, it does, the, it could expand or reduce or break or truncate 
truncate is it's a hard one because sometimes you can truncate the word and people will not read it, so be mindful about it. So it's more around, okay, if you really have a long word, does it is it just a bigger button or is it actually the button breaks into two lines or this in my experience that has been like that, so we try to design, or at least for example with a new app, we try to design a system that we don't have two buttons together, never. Because if you have two buttons together and you have German in both, it would be like that, it's horrible. So we always try to have one on the other and things like this. So at least can scale, that's one. Uh, or we can truncate if the user can expand. So things like this. That would be one. And the other in terms of like how many kids. Um, the things, for example, booking, uh, it has so many kids that are maybe, maybe like 10,000 or more than that. Uh, I never counted them, uh, but apart from booking, uh, it, it's been like 1.5 thousand keys, and it's crazy. Because, and this is a, another thing I didn't mention, but it's important. If you are paying for, you know, translators, and they are charging by the hour, or it could be charging by words and stuff like that, you really want to have a set of keys and you want to have your system as clean as possible so they don't go and try to translate stuff that you will never use. So some systems would have say 2,000 keys and you're like, hey, try, let's translate all these 2,000. And they're like, D -d 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 -d. and actually on your code you use 100. You should translate those only. So, uh, so yeah, you, you have to um, somehow always check like, all these keys are being used, yes, no, if not, kill them. Remove them. No fear of missing out. You don't need them. So then you always have like this uh, really nice set that you can go into things. Thank you. Okay. Just to get back on the first question. Yes. So you said oh, there is uh, some uh, too long word. You insert a rule. You can insert a rule. Yeah. That there is an like, exception. But this is only for critical parts of the app, not for the every key, right? No, no, I think, yeah, yeah. It, it could be. So you, you have, for example, the ability to say, Buttons always can uh, have this uh, width, or at, on the actual software to translate, you can say you cannot exceed more than 20 characters. So you either do the logic on the app, on the client, or whatever, how technical you want to be. So you do the logic there, or you actually put the constraints on the translators. And you're like, you have to say the thing in this amount of characters. So, or you could have both in stream cases. If you, if you want to. But yeah, you have those two things to play. So either constraints on the on the translation side or constraints on the app, both. That's how I